Hello and welcome back to AB 474 Indoor Environmental Control. We are currently in Chapter 5 of um, our text, Heat Transmission and Building Structures, and we are in the fourth section. So we've already covered conduction, convection, and radiation in the first three sections. And in this fourth section, we are going to briefly discuss uh, evaporation and condensation. Uh, these are our um, latent energy exchanges and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on them because they uh, typically don't comprise a, a large uh, portion of the heat transmission through our building structures but we would be remiss to uh, ignore them entirely uh, so we'll just talk briefly about each one of them and uh, specifically highlight w uh, what application or what uh, 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 when each of them is uh, contributing significantly within our environmental control. Um, so let's start with evaporation. <coughs> and as we said, this is a, a form of latent energy exchange. And if you recall from when we were discussing uh, psychrometrics, latent energy exchange uh, occurs without a change in thermal conditions. So um, uh, with evaporation, uh, this is the absorption. <coughs> of energy as water changes states from liquid to water vapor. <clears throat> and it occurs when our <clears throat> Uh, vapor pressure is less than our saturation vapor pressure. And we can um, allow it to happen naturally, so we can, um, as long as this uh, vapor pressure is less than the saturation vapor pressure, there is a natural motivation for evaporation to occur. We can also add energy and further this process along uh, by essentially uh, adjusting those um, uh, the the current um, by occurring these by adjusting the uh, state of our vapor pressures. Um, <clears throat> if we wanted to quantify the energy transfer due to evaporation, the governing equation is uh, based upon the mass flux. <clears throat> so essentially, how much water is being evaporated? and the latent heat of vaporization and how much energy each of those molecules of water um, can <clears throat> absorb uh, as it changes states. The process of evaporation uh, is important when we're thinking about uh, homeotherms and their ability to regulate their body temperature, so kind of tying in chapter four as well. So when we uh, look at the importance of evaporation, we could be talking about it for evaporative cooling systems, so we saw it with our psychrometric processes, um, um, and if that's the case, it's very important there, but it's also very important from our chapter four looking at uh, the occupant within our environment. But in terms of contributions, uh, to our uh, energy transfer through our building, this is uh, pretty much negligible. So we're not going to spend a lot of time with it in this chapter, uh, but as we talk about heat transfer in general, I uh, wanted to make sure that we're uh, considering it as a, a possibility. <clears throat> there could be a case in which we need to do an energy or mass balance that it should be included, uh, but for this class, most of what we're going to do, uh, it, it's going to be a, a negligible contribution. Um, when we talk about condensation, it is also a latent energy exchange. <clears throat> and in this case, it's the opposite of evaporation, so it's the release of energy. release of energy during the change from water vapor to liquid. 
and again, in terms of looking at um, heat transfer through uh, our building structure, condensation is typically not a, uh, a major source of, of energy transfer. Um, and we hope that it's not a major source of, of energy transfer. Um, it occurs <clears throat> when uh, the temperature of our surface or our medium or our material, we're going to say medium, uh, in our case many times it's the surface. Uh, we talked also about cases whenever it could be the air, which is when we get fog, fog. Um, <coughs> uh, falls below the dew point temperature of the air surrounding that medium. Um, when it becomes a problem is whenever it occurs where we don't want it to occur. So it could occur um, outside, uh, on an outside wall, on an inside wall, or within a wall. <clears throat> um, and any of those cases can be a problem, but especially we're concerned about the within a wall. We don't want condensation happening within our wall sections. Uh, this can lead to significant problems uh, with our, uh, especially with our insulation. Um, and we'll get into some examples of that. Uh, but you might might be okay with condensation outside your wall. You might not. You typically don't want condensation inside a wall because that's happening inside your facility, uh, inside the environment you want to control. Um, and we definitely don't want it within a wall. Um, the way that we determine where our condensation is happening, we can kind of look at our... Um, analogous electrical circuit to, to point this out, but we can calculate uh, point temperatures <clears throat> within our wall, anywhere within our wall, but typically we want to do it at each wall interface because that's an easy logical place to do it. And so it looks something like this on our electric analog or our thermal resistance circuit. So essentially, you would calculate the temperature at each of your nodes. And if any of those temperatures is less than your dew point temperature, then you have condensation within your wall. Um, it's important to consider this for both winter and summer conditions. So if we think through kind of quickly a scenario, we talked a little bit about uh, vapor barriers in our, um, what well, we were talking a little bit about vapor barriers. And um, we might think about the placement of a vapor barrier and where would you want it to be. And um, just remembering that <clears throat> anywhere you place that vapor barrier will no longer allow moisture to pass. So it means that the moisture becomes trapped and uh, changes uh, the air conditions uh, within your wall section and uh, can actually promote condensation uh, within your wall section uh, if it's placed in the wrong place. So the idea is to, if you expect to have condensation within your wall, you place a vapor barrier before the place where that condensation will happen. And um, it becomes a challenge if you do both winter and summer conditions because where you expect your condensation to happen within your wall is the opposite for those conditions. So if you think in winter, your coldest temperatures are on the outside of the building, meaning that your coldest temperatures uh, and the places where you're likely to have condensation are closer to the outside of the wall. And in summertime, you're cooling the indoor uh, conditions. So your, cool, your um, coolest air is on the inside of the building, meaning that you're more likely to get condensation the closer to the inside the building you are. Um, that's where we're going to stop with evaporation and condensation. And the, the final section uh, that we're going to cover uh, for Chapter 5 is related to bringing everything together and looking at mixed mode heat transfer.